Hello, everyone. Welcome to our sixth session of Genomics of Kidney Disease webinar series, sponsored by the Center for Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic. We are delighted to have Dr. Zan join us today. Dr. Zan is an associate professor at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and her expertise is in glomerular disease. In fact, she's published over 60 papers really with primary focus on a wide variety of glomerular disease. Dr. Zan was a fellow a uh, year uh, younger than me, I think, or a couple of years. And it's just a joy to see her rise to greatness and really change the field uh, in glomerular disease. And we'll learn today more about uh, how she's integrated genetic testing um, in the care of her patients. So without further ado, uh, I'd like us to learn a little bit more about you, Dr. Zan, um, who you are uh, in the world of nephrology, your current practice, and how you started getting interested uh, in integrating genomic care for your patients. Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be here and thank you for the invitation. So I'm a nephrologist at Mayo Clinic Rochester and you know I specialize in seeing patients with glomerular diseases. I never really had any formal training in, um, you know, testing for genetic diseases or really knowing how to incorporate it in my practice. But my interest, you know, in trying to incorporate genetic testing into the practice really came about after we got a grant for, from Center for Individualized Medicine uh, to really try and further investigate um, cases of genetic FSGS um, in our practice. And then over time, as we were testing you know, more and more patients realizing that uh, genetic FSGS in adult patient is not as uncommon as, you know, we think. We usually think of pediatric population or if you have family history, but, you know, in our population, we realize that there's a fair number of patients that actually do have genetic FSGS and they may be mislabeled as secondary FSGS or primary FSGS. And that's really when I kind of got interested in just kind of learning more and trying to incorporate that more routinely into my practice. Dr. Zain, when do you think this momentum started, about how long ago? So this was, I want to say, about three or four years, or maybe four years ago uh, that we started. We initially had a small grant to, you know, test, um, initially started with like 10 patients, and we then expanded it. And then over time, with the help of the rest of our group, so I was, you know, had this grant with Dr. Fervenza, so we're, you know, doing this testing specifically for glomerular diseases, but then it sort of extended out to other, you know, tubular interstitial diseases and, you know, stones and, you know, CKD of unknown origin. And I know you have had other speakers from our Mayo group, like Dr. Hogan and Dr. Liskey, who have been heavily involved as well. Wonderful. So we're, we're excited to hear about your experience and what we've, you've learned over the last three to four years. Um, can you give us your perspective for, as a nephrologist who's practiced, um, taking care of glomerular diseases, pre-genetic integration and post-genetic integration. What do you see is the value um, of genetic testing? Why would you consider it relevant for your patient population? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in many of the cases, knowing whether or not patient has a underlying, you know, uh, genetic mutation or gene mutation can really impact how you may uh, treat the patient, how you may counsel the patient. Uh, so for example, in cases of, um, you know, FSGS, if it turns out that it's, you know, genetic, a lot of times these patients are getting immunosuppressive therapy because we think they have, you know, primary FSGS. And knowing that the cause is not an underlying, you know, uh, primary protocytopathy when your immune system is involved, knowing that there's a, you know, gene mutation can really, you know, change how you would approach that patient and probably, you know, not want to treat them with immunosuppressive therapy, which is not without risk and can increase your risk of infection and whatnot and other side effects. Uh, it can have impact in terms of how you counsel them about, you know, should they progress to end stage kidney disease? What does that mean for post-transplant care, right? You know, we know if you truly have, you know, primary protocytopathy or FSGS, your risk of recurrence is very high as high as 90% or more. Whereas if you have a genetic, you know, um, disease and risk of recurrence would be, you know, very, very low, almost none probably. Um, 
And so it's, you know, obviously important in that sense and knowing how to counsel them, you know, about post-transplantation would be certainly important in selecting, you know, donors, especially if you're thinking of living donors, knowing whether or not your patient has a genetic underlying genetic disease. And in other glomerular diseases where I see it, you know, really has application is in patients who have complement mediated thrombotic microangiopathy, whether it's, you know, C3 glomerulopathy or atypical HUS and sort of knowing um, what type of mutation you have may have an impact on how long you may potentially treat this patient with ecolizumab. Would you consider ever stopping it? Or, you know, what would be your approach and how you would you counsel the patient? So in certain diseases can really change how, you know, you approach these patients. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. So the impact is not just on di- identifying a diagnosis, but it can impact treatment. And as you alluded to, even duration of treatment. So uh, excited to hear um, from you, uh, uh, hopefully some representative cases to share that insight. Um, and along those lines, guide us into which patients we should be thinking about when we think about genetic testing. All right. So I'll share with you a few of the cases of, um, you know, um, basically FSGS and how, you know, the diagnosis came about. Um, so the first case uh, was a female who had the diagnosis of uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and she did not really have any known family history of kidney disease, no family members on dialysis, no transplant, nothing. And she actually was diagnosed with minimal change disease at age 22. And um, we don't really have all the detailed history of way back when, you know, she got this diagnosis, but uh, she really had not been treated, which was somewhat unusual, but, and she had variable degrees of protein urea as low as 3.2 grams, all the way up to nine grams. And, you know, we came in contact with her when she was around age 46, when she had come for a second opinion in terms of management of her FSGS. And she actually had a repeat biopsy at that time that showed the FSGS lesion. This is a representation. So you can see the segmental scar over here, whereas the rest of the tuft looks okay. And then most importantly, obviously in patients with FSGS, you always wanna look at electron microscopy and look at the degree of foot process effacement. And you can see over here in these arrows that it's just like fully effaced. It's just kind of 100% foot process effacement. You really can't see you know, the foot processes of the podocytes. Um, and at the time that she got the kidney biopsy, her creatinine was about 1.8. She had about over seven grams of protein and her albumin was low. So clinically, she had nephrotic syndrome. And so to put that together, we thought, okay, well, clinically, she has nephrotic syndrome. On histology, we see diffuse food process effacement. This would be consistent with the diagnosis of primary FSGS. So she was started on high-dose prednisone in combination with salcept. But there was really no significant response to either of the combination therapy, I should add. And so tacrolimus was added on. So now she's on triple therapy. And actually a month into this triple therapy, she was hospitalized for severe neutropenia. And so her MMF was stopped, her prednisone was tapered, and then she was continued on program for essentially another four years until she was age 50. And at the time you can see that, you know, her, her disease is progressing. So her creatinine is now up to 2.2. She still has nephrotic range protein urea and her albumin is still suppressed. And so that was the point to kind of think back that, you know, this just kind of does not make sense. One, she really never got treatment way back, you know, when she was diagnosed and that is unusual without, you know, having, you know, rapid progression. And now you have her on, you know, triple therapy with side effects and she's still, you know, nephrotic. And so that's when decision was made to move ahead and do genetic testing. And this is the result of her genetic testing. So she had actually two gene mutation, two different mutations on a different alleles. So she was a compound heterozygote in mutation in podosin gene. And so, and this clearly would explain sort of early, you know, onset of her disease, which was at age 22 and her obviously lack of response to therapy. And that's when, you know, her immunosuppression was stopped and her children actually got tested and the older son was positive for the first heterozygote mutation. And this patient actually did progress to end-stage kidney disease, and she did get a living kidney transplantation, but an unrelated living kidney transplantation. So this really had impact on, obviously, management of the patient. So knowing that, you know, she didn't need immunosuppressive therapy, counseling her for 
um, you know, what to expect post-transplantation in selecting donors. And I have another case. Um, this patient was also a female with diagnosis of FSGS. Uh, her father had a history of kidney disease with very limited history. She, he had been deceased and, you know, uh, never ended up on dialysis that we know of, but just, you know, not much more detail um, known. Um, the patient herself was diagnosed with having proteinuria during her pregnancy at age 26 and had a biopsy around that time that showed FSGS lesion. And at the time it was thought to be secondary because she did not have nephrotic syndrome. And so we you know, got to meet her at around age 53, and she had a repeat biopsy done that showed, um, still showed the FSGS, but a lot more scarring. So there was global sclerosis, basically in 75% of the gloms, there was segmental sclerosis present. She had fair amount of fibrosis in the interstitial compartment, and her EM showed no deposits, moderate for process effacement. She had some wrinkling of basement membrane, but really no thinning, no lamination, no other really major abnormality and her IF, I didn't put it here, but IF was negative. And so she was, um, and also clinically again, she did not have nephrotic syndrome. So her creatinine was 1.5, but her albumin was, you know, 3.7 and she had, you know, non-nephrotic um, range proteinuria about two grams. And so she was given the, and also histologically was less than 50, less than 80% food process effacement. And clinically she was given a diagnosis of secondary FSGS. But the question was, you know, why did she have secondary FSGS, which is, you know, another name for what we call maladaptive FSGS. Um, she was not obese. So, you know, that didn't count. She didn't have sleep apnea. She, her blood pressure was very well controlled and it was in the setting of CKD and no history of, you know, prematurity, no nephrectomy. There was really nothing Like we just couldn't come up with a reason to say why she would have this FSGS lesion. And again, knowing that she also had this family history father who had kidney disease, even though the details were not known, uh, we decided to move ahead with genetic testing. And at the time that she got her genetic testing, you can see her creatinine has progressed further, it's 2.2. She still has 2.1 grams of protein. And again, her albumin is normal. And her genetic results came back and it was positive for the whole 4 a 5 which normally is the mutation you see in the X-linked Alport syndrome, which is you know, not unheard of, but less usual to see uh, females affected, but it definitely can be depending on which chromosome is uh, deactivated and which one is not. And in her situation, it was of significance and it had resulted in her developing kidney disease. And again, we are realizing this more and more that many of the patients who actually have FSGS lesion have abnormalities in the collagen gene, even though, you know, the classic teaching obviously is that the abnormality would be in the basement membrane. And so in her situation, her mom was still alive. So she got tested and she was negative. So we think that, you know, probably the gene came from the father. She had for the progression of her kidney disease and she went for transplant evaluation. And actually her son came forward, but he was found to have elevated creatinine and was denied uh, obviously to, you know, donate and recommendation was made for him to get tested. And patient ultimately received a living unrelated kidney transplantation. And so this um, did not change the management of the patient, but it was patient was always frustrated with why she had, you know, this FSGS lesion and ultimately we were able to give her a diagnosis, but it had huge impact in terms of what to expect post-transplantation, how to, you know, evaluate the donor. And so her case, you know, was, uh, it was, you know, important to know that she indeed this, did have this um, gene mutation. Dr. Zane, if you don't mind me asking, um, your first case really, um brought up the question of how, when we think about current literature about uh, remission rates in FSGS, and we always think about the outcomes being um, not as exciting, not as promising as with minimal change, for example, high rates of, of uh, lack of remission or low rates of complete remission, partial remission. And for uh, a long time, we, we criticized some of the literature by saying that perhaps those FSGS trials included secondary along with primary, and perhaps that's why immune suppression was, that was not effective. Has, has anyone looked to see, uh, now that we're realizing that genetics play a role here, how, mm -hmm. how much is the lack of response, how much is attributed to secondary or maladaptive versus uh, genetic causes 
um, causing the, the response rates to be not as promising for those primary cases of FSGS? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that kind of brings up the point that, you know, really understanding why a patient has an FSGS lesion is essential, especially when you're designing clinical trials. So most of the clinical trials obviously are aiming for using immunosuppressive therapy uh, to see, you know, if you can achieve response. But when you look back at majority of these clinical trials, you realize that many of the patients that were included probably did not have primary FSGS, that perhaps they had the maladaptive FSGS or very well could have had a genetic FSGS. And, you know, in order to really be able to properly select a patient, you need to not only obviously look at the biopsy, look at the um, electron microscopy, most importantly, look at the degree of food process effacement, but you also need to clinically look at the patient, make sure these patients are, you know, meet the definition of nephrotic syndrome. And many of these uh, clinical trials, if you look back, some of the patients who are enrolled have subnephrotic protein urea. There is no mention of the measurements of albumin. And very well, they could have had, you know, genetic FSGS. And that certainly would be another reason to consider doing genetic testing in patients, especially by the time you're sending a patient to clinical trial, right? They probably have not responded to prednisone. You're kind of seeking other therapies. So it would be important to know, make sure that patient doesn't have um, genetic FSGS. And I can share with you um, some of our more recent work of like kind of knowing who are the patients that you really ought to be thinking about um, genetic FSGS. Um, we did um, this study that was recently published in Mayo Clinic Proceeding, where we're basically we're trying to figure out who are the patients with an FSGS lesion that would benefit from getting genetic testing done. And basically, we had a total of 49 patients, and these patients were kind of put into four separate groups. One group were those that we called basically having primary FSGS. These are, again, patients with diffuse with process effacement, and clinically, they have nephrotic syndrome. And we had 13 in this group. And then the other group was secondary FSGS, which is you have an FSGS lesion, you have less than 80% food process defacement, and you do not clinically have nephrotic syndrome. So basically have a normal albumin. Now your protein urea could be subnephrotic or nephrotic. Um, but these patients who were in this category had to have a reason for having the FSGS lesion. So they either had nephrectomies or they were, you know, had obesity with sleep apnea, for example. There was some thing in their history to say why they may have developed an FSGS lesion. But we also had another group, which the definition in terms of, you know, the biopsy findings and clinical presentation was similar to the other group, except that we could not find a cause similar to that second case that I showed you. So again, the patient is not, doesn't have reduced nephron mass and the, there is no increased demand on the glomeruli. And then the last group was this group that we called undetermined FSGS. And these are patients that you just can't fit them into a category, meaning that they don't have nephrotic syndrome, but they have diffuse food process effacement on histology or vice versa. They have segmental food process effacement, but their albumin is low and they're nephrotic. And you're just, you know, you don't know, what do I call this? So we call those undetermined FSGS. And then we moved ahead and did genetic testing in all these patients. And you can see the rate of detecting a gene mutation is vastly different. So if you have this group of basically discordant histology and clinical presentation, your rate of positive response or perhaps detecting a gene mutation is, you know, over 80%. The second highest group was those with secondary FSGS that you could not find an obvious reason for why they would have a lesion of FSGS. And this was about 60%. And Interestingly, though, in the group that we thought we knew a cause for their FSGS, five patients had gene mutation, and four out of five actually did have family history of FSGS. And in the primary FSGS group, there was only one patient that was positive, and this patient was steroid resistant. And in this group, we had two patients that were steroid um, resistant, and basically one patient had uh, positive genetic testing results. And here is sort of the breakdown of the gene mutation that we found. So this is the overall cohort. And, um, you know, we had basically over 40% uh, detection rate, but you can see detection rate is not the same between the four groups. So really high, you know, in this latter group of undetermined FSGS and really low in the primary FSGS. 
And here's sort of the breakdown of the different genes that were positive, but you can see collagen abnormalities is very common. Podocyte specific genes such as podocin and nephrine were the second most common um, gene mutation. And so based off of this, we have made uh, recommendation as who are the people that would benefit from getting genetic testing done if you find an FSGS lesion. And basically the first group is, are those that have primary FSGS for, you know, based on biopsy and clinically, but they don't respond to therapy. And if you have a patient in that category, regardless of the age of the patient, you probably should consider doing genetic testing. The other group are those that have secondary FSGS, or again, sort of like a maladaptive FSGS, but you can't find a cause. They don't have reduced nephron mass and there is no evidence that you know, there's increased demand on their kidney. And those would be patient to consider doing genetic testing. The third group would be those that have secondary FSGS and you do have an identifiable cause, but they have a strong family history of having kidney disease progressing to end stage um, needing you know, transplant or dialysis. That should also be a red flag that maybe this is you know, a genetic form of FSGS. And lastly, which is, I would say, is the highest yield group is when your clinical and histological findings are discordant, that you just can't quite put your patient in one sort of primary versus secondary. And this would be the group that has the highest yield of you finding an FSGS lesion. And again, these were all adults that we looked at in our cohort. Um, so just again, being above age 18 does not necessarily um, rule out the possibility that your patient may have a genetic cause. Thank you, Dr. Zan. Uh, I'd love to hear your reflection about um, effort, yield, cost, effectiveness of considering uh, genetic testing to all patients who have FSGS. As you pointed out, um, interestingly enough, in your cohort of your 13 patients that everyone was confident histologically and clinically that their primary FSGS, the response rate was still 61% maybe a tiny bit better than the published data, um, not by a lot. Um, but when we think about resistance to therapy, that means you're waiting out some exposure of immunosuppression, hoping for some response. And then when there is no response, perhaps instead of escalating, then consider genetic testing. Is there value to consider genetic testing upfront for any FSGS patient that's, that's diagnosed um, at the time of biopsy? So that's an interesting question. I don't think we are there right now to say, you know, just upfront do genetic testing in everyone. Keep in mind that genetic testing is not sort of black and white. It's not always like, oh, it's pathogenic or it's not pathogenic. There is, you know, a fair number of times that you get results of variants of unknown significance. And that sometimes can be you know, concerning to the patient, stressful for the provider, like, what do you make of this result? Like, is this concerning? Is this not? Would this change over time? It may be a VUS now, maybe 10 years from now, you know, that it's pathogenic. So it's not always black and white. And so you want to be careful knowing, like, what is it that you're looking for? And do you have a good reason of why, you know, you think this patient may have genetic testing? Um, and so I would say, you know, a patient has a clear cut, again, evidence of primary FSGS, really, there is no I would not necessarily consider doing genetic testing unless you know we can show that they are treatment resistant. And in that situation, yes, the yield would be high. Um, similar again with secondary FSGS, where you can find an obvious cause and patient doesn't have family history, probably would be the yield of you know finding positive result would be low. So I would still try to be selective about who you would test. Now, could this change maybe 50 years from now that becomes part of like routine blood tests? They just put the panel for, you know, FSGS maybe, but, uh, you know, we're still kind of learning. And again, knowing how to interpret the result is also important because again, it's not always that there, there are a fair number of times that we get results back that there's a VUS and you're just kind of not sure what to make of it. I think that's uh, wise counsel about hold your horses, get excited, but don't go all in yet. It's part of um, the puzzle as you figure out the patient that it's not it's not going to give you the 100% answer. So you have right. to rely on your clinical judgment and histological data and the whole picture. And this, this will contribute an important part, but it's not uh, the end all be all. Right. So we talked quite a bit about FSGS and you alluded earlier to complement mediated diseases. Can you elaborate a bit more about other diseases where you might want to consider genetic testing for 
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so obviously FSGS is a group that we you know think about genetic testing, but another group that I think has a you know high yield that doing genetic testing can be helpful are patients who have basically complement mediated diseases. Now this could be in the category of C3 glomerulopathy, which would be C3 glomerulonephritis or dense deposit disease, where you expect to see gene mutations typically in the uh, complement uh, genes that uh, regulate the alternative pathway, or also in patients who present with thrombotic macroangiopathy that we think is complement mediated. And especially if you have a patient that has TMA, sometimes it's not very clear cut of what the cause of TMA may be, right? The TMA is sort of this umbrella diagnosis, but there could be a lot of different causes for it. It could be, you know, for example, antiphospholipid syndrome. It may be uncontrolled uh, blood pressure, uh, scleroderma renal crisis, pregnant. I mean, you know, there, you know, there's many causes, but if you're thinking it may be complement mediated when you're thinking more, for example, like a typical HUS sort of picture, you know, knowing, you know, whether or not you have genetic disease is important as it may impact, um, essentially, that it can help determine, you know, duration of therapy. And I do have a case that I think would be interesting to highlight the importance of doing genetic testing in a patient, um, you know, with C3 glomerulopathy, which was a great learning experience for me. Uh, this was a patient, a female who was diagnosed with C3 glomerulopathy, essentially at age 45. This was based on a kidney biopsy, and basically it was the subtype was the dense deposit disease. She was initially treated with Salcept, was then switched to tacrolimus, then she went on combination therapy for about 12 years. And her alternative complement pathway was shown to be active. Um, so we knew that. And she also was found to have IgG lambda in the blood. And so by the time, so her diagnosis of dense deposit disease predated when we realized that, you know, dense deposit disease in a subset of patients may be related to presence of monoclonal gammopathy with the thought that monoclonal gammopathies can activate your alternative pathway. They may act as a factor H antibody or um, other ways that they may basically activate, you know, your complement system. So then basically when realizing that she had this IgG lambda and she had the dense deposit disease, the concern was that, well, maybe this IgG lambda is triggering her pathway. And so she was actually enrolled in a clinical trial that we had at the time using daratumumab, which is an anti-plasma cell therapy, anti-CD38. And at the time that she was enrolled, uh, you know, she had fair amount of protein, urea 3.6 gram, her urine was active, 40 to 50 red blood cells per high power field, and her creatinine was 1.28. And so she actually enrolled in the uh, trial and she received 16 infusion and her prograph and tacrolimus, sorry, her tacrolimus and cells that had been discontinued. But by the end of the trial, things were a lot worse. So her creatinine now was up to 1.98, her protein was up to 8.6 gram, and now she had even more hematuria. And so you take a step back and you think, okay, if the complement system was activated by the monoclonal gammopathy, and this is a very effective, the daratumumab is a very effective drug, drug in treating monoclonal gammopathy, why are things getting worse? Uh, and you know, maybe this is just coincidence that she has her alternative pathway activated because you know there's high risk variants or gene mutation in her complement system, and the monoclonal protein is just unrelated. So basically, basically she just has an MGUS. Right, so we decided to move ahead and look back and she needed, you know, genetic testing for the complement genes. And this is the summary of her genetic testing. So she didn't have an obvious mutation, but she had high risk alleles and not just one of them, she had six copies of them. So four copies were in the factor H and two copies were in the C3 gene. And so these are high risk alleles that increase your risk of developing um, uh, C3 dense deposit disease or C3 glomerulonephritis. And knowing that she hadn't responded to a therapy for her monoclonal protein and knowing that she did have high risk variants, six copies of them in her complement genes, we decided to move ahead with ecolizumab and she's in full remission now. So her cranium has come back down to 1.4. She has no protein urea and her urine is normal. And this kind of highlights the importance of before sort of Making a decision that, you know, a disease, you know, in her case, had we, you know, paid attention or kind of thought about genetic testing up front and not been so excited about the monoclonal protein, you know, potentially picking the therapy, you know, would have been affected. And luckily, you know, she has responded well now, but 
you know, in patients with C3 glomerulopathy, it's always important to do the genetic testing, even if you think that there is another reason for their complement system to be active, such as, you know, presence of monoclonal gammopathy. And regarding duration of therapy that you had asked me, you know, that becomes more relevant when you're thinking about patients who have complement mediated TMA, especially, you know, atypical HUS. So typically, obviously, you know, these patients, we know patients with atypical HUS benefit from ecolizumab, but the question is, well, how long do you continue with the ecolizumab? You know, should you consider at any point stopping the therapy? And this is, um, you know, not, you know, about four years ago, you know, was published in C. Jason, where, they, you know, the cohorts of patients from France, where they looked to see if you um, stop the ecolizumab, what was the risk of recurrence of the um, TMA? Uh, and it really depended on what kind of gene mutation you had or whether or not you detected the gene mutation. And so what they found basically is that if you do the complement testing and you don't find any pathogenic genes, that if you stop the ecolizumab after you know, six months of therapy, the risk that the patient will have a relapse would be very low. On the other hand, if you had a gene mutation in the factor H, the risk that you would relapse after you start the therapy is over 70%. So knowing whether or not you have a gene mutation and what type of mutation you have would be important because, you know, if you probably wouldn't want to stop therapy in this patient, or even if you did, you really ought to follow this patient very closely. But typical recommendation is that you continue with therapy. If you have, for example, the uh, CD46 variant, your chance of relapse is 50%. So if you stop, you have to really watch this patient very closely with uh, weekly to monthly, you know, CBC, haptoglobin check, LDH check, and whatnot. And there were other gene variants such as factor I or factor B, but there just wasn't enough information to know what the risk of the patient number was like too small to make a definite, you know, conclusion. Um, but, you know, it has an impact of, you know, what, what do you counsel the patient? How long do you continue? Many times these patients obviously have hematologic features, so they're anemic, thrombocytopenic, you start them on ecolizumab, and you see that, you know, these hematologic factors get better, but they're, you know, there's still renal involvement, and you want to know, well, how long, how long do I, you know, continue with this? Um, and again, so knowing the gene mutation uh, would be important. It's also important about counseling them uh, post-transplant. Sometimes patients that have factor H mutation, um, especially in patients, for example, with C3 glomerulopathy, may consider that uh, peritransplant duration, you know, time, you may consider use of ecolizumab. So it really affects your, you know, treatment. And I have um, a patient I would like to share with you who had complement mediated TMA and, you know, what knowing, you know, what her genetic results were was helpful. And this was actually a patient who had diagnosis of lupus. Uh, when we you know, met her, she was 20, but her diagnosis was made at age 15. And she had presented at age 20 with acute kidney injury and anasarca. And as a result, she had obviously kidney biopsy done that her biopsy showed class four lupus arthritis. So obviously she was started on, started on prednisone and salsa, which is obviously standard of therapy. But within a week of getting started on treatment, she was admitted to the hospital with AKI, creatinine was 3.3. Now her hemoglobin was down to 6.4. So obviously additional workup was done. She had low platelets, elevated LDH, hapto undetectable, and schistocytes were present, all consistent with thrombotic macroangiopathy. You know, initially acutely she was started on PLEX. Later her Adam TS13 came back was normal. So we knew she didn't have TTP. So the PLEX was stopped. Around the same time, she had also become progressively more hypertensive. She had an MRI that actually suggests that press. And so the concern was, well, is this, you know, all triggered because, um, you know, she's just sort of has malignant hypertension, if you may, and that's what's causing her uh, TMA, or is there another reason? But basically, around that time, obviously, her creatinine was further progressing. She was volume overloaded, hypertensive, and was started on dialysis. And this is sort of the trend of, you know, her labs. And so this is the hemoglobin was 7.2. And obviously, in between, she's getting blood transfusion. So you can see it dips down to 6.7. She gets blood, and it drops down. And around here is when she gets, um, you know, the ecolizumab. So right before, you know, here, and you can see her platelets had dropped down to 46. She gets the ecolizumab and you can see her platelets almost right away within 48 hours, they're, you know, bouncing up. And you can see her hapto was undetectable. And right around the time that she gets the ecolizumab, it starts um, normalizing. And um, so clear clearly ecolizumab was beneficial in, you know, 
helping correct her the hematologic features of her thrombotic macroangiopathy. And so she had another also repeat biopsy because of the progression she was having. Um, though this was like a couple of months, you know, down the line. And you can see, obviously, she has classic features of the lupus. You can see these like wire loop deposits. Uh, and you, can, you could even see immune deposits in her blood vessels that really, you know, involve like global, uh, you know, involvement of the uh, lupus nephritis. But what you could also see is the occlusive thrombus, uh, you know, in her blood vessels. So she clearly had uh, superimposed uh, TMA as well, which was not originally present on her first biopsy that she had. And just to mention that her antiphospholipids were not positive. Um, and so just to kind of share with you the complement mediated TMA in patients who have lupus and potential role for ecolizumab. So this is sort of the largest series that's out there. And there are 11 patients who all had lupus, lupus nephritis, but they also had superimposed TMA. And what's interesting is that if you look at the genetic analysis that was done in this subset of patient out of the 11 patients shown over here, um, one of them, I want to say genetic testing was not done. So out of the 10 patients, six of them had positive, uh, you know, uh, results, uh, suggesting that, you know, in patient who has a lupus nephritis and you get superimposed TMA, you really ought to think about whether or not this patient may have a complement abnormality in the background. And that, you know, it's sort of like a second hit. So you have the lupus and something else happens and that triggers the activation of the alternative pathway. And now you can sort of downregulate your system because you have a sort of a gene mutation. And so they looked at, you know, these patients got treated with ecolizumab and, you know, some of them, you know, they were able to salvage the kidney and in some pa patients they were not. And so in our patients, we obviously moved ahead with doing the genetic testing of the complement system. And we had this variant of unknown significance. And after further discussion between um, the geneticists, um, hematology, nephrology, we all decided that probably this was not a variance of um, significance, meaning that, you know, even though she had this VUS, we didn't think that this was a pathogenic um, mutation. And so the importance of that in her was that we decided that after, she unfortunately never recovered kidney function, but hematological parameters had obviously normalized. So after six months of therapy with ecolizumab and knowing that she didn't have any known gene mutation, we discontinued her ecolizumab and she didn't have relapse of the TMA, at least hematologically. She moved ahead with a kidney transplantation. She was not treated with ecolizumab peritransplantation. She's doing well post-transplant without risk of recurrence. And, you know, thinking back, whether the trigger was that um, uncontrolled blood pressure that she had that, you know, triggered this is, you know, really not known, but it was helpful in knowing that even though she benefited from ecolizumab, she really didn't need lifelong ecolizumab therapy or even, you know, post-transplantation. So that's kind of, those are the two cases that I have to just kind of highlight the importance of genetic testing in patients who have um, you know, complement mediated um, TMA or C3 glomerulopathy. Well, Dr. Zan, thank you so much for sharing those complex cases. Uh, so I'm going to throw the same question at you again. So we talked about the role of doing FSGS upfront, uh, the role of doing genetic testing for FSGS patients upfront. And we learned that it's better to use it as part of a skill set as you think of the entire patient uh, mm -hmm. rather for every patient up front. But in the case that in the first case you talked about where you uh, had the patient with um, concern for dense deposit or C3GN, and then you've got the monoclonal abnormality uh, and you kind of went on to uh, a goose hunt trying to figure out how best to um, treat her renal disease. The question to you, if you have a patient with C3GN up front, what is the benefit risk of pursuing genetic testing for complement mediate abnormalities, regardless of whether there's monoclonal abnormality or not? So I think in patients who have C3 glomerulopathy, I almost always consider doing genetic testing, right? Because uh, as I showed you in the first case, the presence of the monoclonal gammopathy may just be by chance patient, you know, as we get older, you know, if you're above age 80, for example, you know, 8% um, of the population does have MGUS. This would be lower, you know, 2 to 3% if you're above age uh, 50. But, you know, it can just be a coincidence. So in those cases, I think 
uh, it's always helpful to have the you know uh, complement testing done to potentially help you. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you had the complement testing and it was positive, like 100% can be the monoclonal, but would be unlikely, right? So you may decide that you go the route of eculizumab. And I actually had a patient I'm not, I haven't shared uh, with you, but this patient um, had a TMA and had monoclonal gammopathy and uh, had genetic testing that was negative, but initially upfront because she had TMA was treated with eculizumab with no response and then moved ahead to <laughs> treatment of the monoclonal gammopathy and had response. So knowing whether or not your patient has gene mutation, especially in the setting of monoclonal gammopathy, may help you decide which pathway you want to go first. Do you want to go the route of treating the uh, complement cascade, or do you want to treat the monoclonal, thinking that the monoclonal is the trigger? Um, and as, obviously, as I showed you in the other cases of uh, complement-mediated TMA, it's essential to do the genetic testing because even if you don't detect a gene mutation, that means that you probably can stop therapy and just sort of observe the patient. Um, and another point to keep in mind also is that a negative genetic testing doesn't necessarily mean that the patient does not have a gene mutation. It just means that the panels that we currently have right now do not detect a gene mutation, but this obviously can change over time as we learn more and more about you know, different gene mutation, this you know, patient population. So would you propose a new workflow for C3GN uh, to include, evaluate for monoclonal um, studies as well as genetic testing up mm -hmm. front? Absolutely, and that's what we do. Um, even in younger patients, we still do check for monoclonal gammopathy, but definitely if your patient is above age um, 50, you want to check for monoclonal gammopathy, but you also want to, as we talked about, do the genetic testing as well and kind of have all the information before you make a decision on what's the right pathway to take in terms of treating these patients. So you alluded a little bit to the challenges um, of genetic testing. It's not all black and white. So could you elaborate a little bit about what you see are the current challenges and perhaps where do you see the landscape changing for glomerular disease and genetic testing? Yeah. So the challenges are not, or there's quite a few, you know. Um, I think the first one is like, which are the patients that would benefit from genetic testing? Now, obviously we have developed a workflow over the last, you know, five years or so, uh, but this, you know, wasn't always as clear cut and it's not still perhaps as clear cut. So who are the patients that you're going to select to do genetic testing? As we talked about, doesn't necessarily mean that every single patient you see may benefit, but like who, who do you pick for doing genetic testing? And then once you decide that you're going to do the genetic testing, what type of tests and what genes will you test for? So when I showed you our FSGS cohort that we did genetic testing, actually the whole panel that we, they were getting tested for was 350 genes. And the ones that were dedicated for FSGS are over 50 genes, but ultimately we only found nine genes that were of significance. So, you know, which panel do you pick? Do you um, focus on the nine genes that we think are the highest yield? Do you go for a panel that just the, the 50 gene? And you just kind of, as a practice, have to come up with a way of like what kind of makes more sense, what's also feasible. You know, different companies offer different combination of gene tests. Uh, when do you consider doing a limited gene panel or do you consider doing a more uh, kind of uh, comprehensive gene panel? Um, and so knowing what type of test to do and also like where do you send it? There are different companies that offer genetic testing. For us at Mayo, some of them are in-house. So for example, our complement gene is in-house. We do that for FSGS, we send out. Uh, but we have a pan, we have a uh, kind of system of like where do we want to have these um, tests for the uh, FSGS genes, for example, where, where do we, you know, we send them? And then also when the results come back, how do you interpret them? Obviously, sometimes they're Kind of very clear cut. It just says pathogenic and you know, or it says it's negative, but there are sometimes in between that, especially the variance of unknown significance. And then what do you do with that result? Um, you know, how do you counsel the patient? What do you, what do you tell them about these results? Again, if it's clear cut, maybe easier, but sometimes if it's kind of a gray area, you may need to get the input from the geneticist and just kind of have a plan of how you um, counsel the patient. And then when do you stop pursuing genetic testing, right? Sometimes, you know, we do genetic testing, it's negative. You're like, oh, well, it can't be genetic, right? But it's not, um, just because you didn't detect a gene mutation doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't there. And just then depends on, well, what panel did you do? You know, where, 
uh, was it a specific genes you were looking at, or did you had you moved on to whole exome or whole DNA? You know, what, like where do you stop? And just as an example, we have a actually it's a pediatric um, a colleague of mine who had the patients who are twins and have FSGS, and in that case, you're just like, gosh, it just everything um, suggests that this you know, potentially should consider genetic test, you know, genetic FSGS. And if the first panel was negative, which was, so then do you move on to whole exome sequencing? And at what point do you say, well, we have done enough testing, we just haven't found anything, right? And then what do you do when the interpretations change, right? So if you have a variance of unknown significance, it may be a variance of unknown significance now and 10 years from now, it may be, you know, likely pathogenic. So these definitions change over time as more people are tested. And the correlation between the uh, genotype and the phenotype is, you know, more studied. And um, patients who have VUSs need to know that, you know, sometimes we recommend that you check back in, you know, a few years down the line to see if this definition has changed or not. But you need to have a plan for that as well. And then obviously, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges are how do you get insurance coverage? And so um, patients are always concerned about that. And sometimes they say, well, you know, sure, it would be nice to know if I have it, but if you, you know, you're not treating me with anything now and you may not, you know, treat me any different, like, why would I have to, you know, get the genetic testing? And then, you know, we have to kind of think about the pros and cons. And I think ultimately, what I hope we see a change is that more insurance companies realizing the importance of doing the genetic, you know, testing, that the tests become cheaper over time, and they have, you know, and it's easier to now order a panel of 50 genes than do a single gene and it may be the same cost right and so hopefully in the future it just would be something that's more readily accessible and um, the other thing I would also anticipate seeing is you know that each practice kind of has to have an infrastructure for incorporating genetic testing into their clinic and I know you may have covered this in some of the other you know webinars that you have had but basically you want to have a workflow right you want to know which patient is selected, but obviously once you select your patient, you want to have a way of providing pretest counseling and getting insurance approval. We do these currently through our genetic counselors. So there's a kind of clinic we send them to where they meet with a genetic counselor. They tell them about what to expect from the genetic testing. They help us getting the insurance approval. And then we, you know, order the appropriate tests that are selected depending on the clinical presentation. And then once the results are back, actually we review them in our nephrology genomic board, where we have a nephrologist, a pathologist, a geneticist, genetic counselor, all of us kind of review the case, kind of talk about the family kind of history, other features. And that's where we kind of get recommendation as to, okay, do we continue on pursuing genetic testing or have we done enough? And you know, this was probably unlikely and now the tests are negative. This is where we stop. And if it's of significance, how do we counsel the patient? Sometimes, a lot of times we say the family, other family members we recommend that get tested. So you kind of have to have a plan uh, in place. And then ultimately, obviously results is provided to the patient and counseling is provided. And I would say again, for any practice, you know, each practice has to see what kind of fits their workflow and what, um, how to get uh, ways of, you know, again, knowing where to send your tests, how are you going to provide counseling, and ultimately you need to have some genetic counselors on board that can help you with, um, you know, providing um, the counseling to the patient before and after the test results are back. Thank you, Dr. Zant, for a really dynamic um, and exciting discussion uh, about the moving landscape of genomics integration in glomerular disease. Um, we have one question from uh, one of our attendees um, commented that this was a great discussion and wondering if you could get access to biological samples from the FSGS clinical trials where the patients did not perform genetic testing and study the frequency of genetic um, abnormalities or variants. Um, and his comment is this could be important to know because despite the significance, they might have implications in response to treatment and, and outcomes. Is there a way we can those earlier? Ask you, I wish, no, I don't think, I mean, I, as far, I mean, I'm not aware of any clinical trials that has um, had samples that later they have gone back and done genetic testing, obviously depends on what samples were collected at the time. But yes, I absolutely agree that it highlights the importance of how you may potentially label a drug as ineffective, not because the drug is ineffective, but because the patient was not, the patient population that was selected wasn't really the patients that you would have expected to respond. 
and it, you, it's surprising to go back and look at the clinical trials and see how many times, again, there is no evaluation of histology, like the electron microscopy, there is no evaluation of serum albumin, that some patients are subnephrotic, and, uh, and we still, you know, they have been enrolled in the therapy, and then we ultimately say, oh, the trial is negative, but maybe we are not giving the drug the, the chance to, for it to work, right? Is there, is there an opportunity to redo the same old trials, but do them with the right approach? Like you said, having the right characteristics of what primary is, incorporate genetic testing for those cases that are maladaptive or not clear cause, and, and look, look at, you know, look at CNIs one more time or looking at cell yeah. sub time and see what the outcome in terms of remission would look like. I mean, I hope so. It depends, I guess, where the trial is, you know, but a lot of times when we have given feedback to um, sponsor initiated trials, when they have come to us saying like, you know, are you interested in, you know, participating many times we go back and say, hey, you know, have you considered, you know, that you're not really perhaps selecting the right patients? Have you considered, you know, changing your cutoffs for protein urea or albuminuria or having ways of looking at electron microscopy? So we do provide, you know, the feedback. Some of the limitation obviously is that the, group that's true primary FSGS and is resistant to therapy that is not a genetic cause is a very small cohort of patients. So a lot of times kind of bringing down the cutoff of protein urea and whatnot is just kind of as a way to kind of get more patients in, but obviously then you have a heterogeneous group, but you know, that usually ends up being the limiting factor is how many patients are you going to be able to enroll? This was fantastic. I've learned so much and uh, hoping that we can disseminate this knowledge to more um, nephrologists in the community to help better care of our patients. Thank you, Dr. Zan. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you again. Bye. Bye.